there's this very interesting conversation that takes place uh, between God and Satan um, in the Old Testament at the beginning of the book of Job that I think is a really good starting spot for us today. Um, and, and I think uh, this, um, this compelling case that Satan makes against Job and really against humanity um, speaks a lot to the reason why suffering comes into our lives and also why God allows it to come into our lives. And so Satan says this to God. He says, does Job serve God for nothing? Does Job serve God for nothing? In other words, what he was saying is, Job's not serving you. He's serving you because it pays to do so. He, he's not serving you for you. He's serving you as a means to serve himself. And so you boast about how upright he is and how awesome this guy is, but go ahead and take your hand off of him and he will curse you right to your face because he doesn't really love you. No, he loves himself and he's using you to get what he wants. Now, this is not just a claim against Job. This is a claim against all of us as believers, right? And then God does a rather scary and remarkable thing. He says, in so many words, he says, all right, let's see if you're right. And he takes his hand off of Job and allows Job's life to be completely turned upside down. And in moments, Job's children are slaughtered. His life's work and his livelihood is completely destroyed. His body is attacked with disease. And even his best three friends come and all they want to do is tell him why all of this is his fault. And they're trying to figure it out with him. Even his wife discourages him and says, hey, just curse God and die. Like, just give up. I would get it. And the rest of the book of Job is this account of how he lives out this wilderness experience of suffering and loss as he looks for God in the midst of it. And so an accusation from Satan, a test from God, and a, a, a human sufferer who, by the way, never gets an explanation for why he experiences all this loss. Now, can I submit something to you? Satan may be onto something here. Because when we come to faith, when we give our lives to Jesus, we're coming to God for ourselves, aren't we? Think about that. When you first came to Jesus, you weren't necessarily coming to him to serve him and to love him. You were coming to him because you had needs. Amen? Amen. There was something that you needed. And so God comes into our lives and he heals us, he forgives us, he speaks to us, we feel his presence, we see his provision. But you and I will never go deep in our relationship with God until we get to the place where we learn how to serve him for him alone. That, that we'll never go deep in relationship with him until we learn how to seek him and love him and serve him for his heart and not just his hand, All right? And so anytime you and I experience wilderness, uh, it is in those seasons that God is saying to you, in so many words, God is saying to you, now we're gonna find out if you are serving me for your own selfish self-interest or if you're serving me for me. And that's uncomfortable, isn't it? It's uncomfortable, right? And Job, at the end of his process of grieving and pursuing God and hanging on, he was able to say this at the end of the book of Job, Job 42, verse 5. And I love how it reads in the message. And all that's Carrie's favorite translation, so I'm going to quote the message. I love how it reads in the message. It says, I admit I once lived by rumors of you. Now I have it all firsthand from my own eyes and ears. Think about that. Before, I, I, heard, I had heard of you before, but now I know you. That was his experience. And by the way, that can be our testimony as well. Amen? Amen? So we've been in a series called Honey in the Rock, and the target for us as a church 
has been to learn what it means to abide in the wilderness. We have to be a people who learn how to abide in the wilderness. All throughout scripture, we see this theme from the meta narrative, the, the overarching uh, storyline, all the way down even to the individual lives of the characters you find in scripture. And matter of fact, you could also do this in your own life. If you're able to zoom out of your own life enough and just step back and take a look of it, at it, you, you will see that life is full of wilderness experiences. Famines and feasts will visit you. And the sooner or later that we understand uh, that, that that's the case and that we don't use hard times as a means to accuse God, we don't use it as a means to accuse God or question his existence or his goodness, but rather we set our hearts on pilgrimage and abide, right? You can look like Job. You can look like Job. All right, you will meet God and you'll get to know him in a transformative way. And so Psalm 81 is um, the passage we've used for this series. And as we've looked at it together a few weeks ago, I told you a couple things as we looked at it uh, one time. I said that life is a wilderness. Remember that? Life is a wilderness. But that there's a rock in the wilderness. There's a rock in the wilderness. God is in the wilderness. Now, I know when most of us get into wilderness experiences, when we are in the midst of suffering, what do we want? We just want to get through it, don't we? We panic in it. We run from it. But what I want you to see is God is there. You got to look for him, though. So life is a wilderness. There's a rock in the wilderness. God is there. But also there's honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock, meaning that there is a treasure in your suffering and in your hard times that is there for you. But it's really important for you to understand that there's conditions to this, that it is very possible for you to go through seasons of suffering and get absolutely nothing out of it because you curl up in a little ball and you don't face anything and you wait for it to go away. You can suffer and get nothing or you can look for God and you can look for the honey. That's what you could do. And so uh, that's what I want to talk about further today. I want to talk about the conditions of finding honey, right? If, if God says there's honey in the rock for us, what do we need to do to get it? And I believe Psalm 81 actually will tell us. All right, so I'm not just coming off the top of my head. I think Psalm 81 is going to tell us, amen? All right, so let's, let's look at it together. We're going to look at Psalm 81. We're going to start in verse seven. It says, you cried to me in trouble, and I saved you. I answered out of the thundercloud, and I tested your faith when there was no water at Meribah. Listen to me, O my people, while I give you stern warnings. O Israel, if you would only listen to me, you must never have a foreign God. You must not bow down before a false God, for it was I, the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it with good things." Amen. All right. So if you and I want to experience honey from the rock, we need to do two things. All right. Here are the conditions. Number one, the first thing we need to do is we need to obey and trust God. All right. The psalmist says, listen to me, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. The second thing we have to do is we have to look for and forsake our idols. Look for and forsake our idols. You must never have a foreign God. You must not bow down before a false God. Now, I want to, I, I battled whether or not I wanted to share this with you guys um, because <laughs> security. Um, but here's the deal. Um, so I've just kind of stumbled upon and started studying out of nowhere the book of Job uh, the last couple of weeks. And the reason why is because that, that, that quote, that accusation of Satan has been reverberating in my brain for the last couple months. This accusation is of, does Job serve God for nothing? I've been hearing, does Sean serve God for nothing? And uh, it's been 
It's been quite the wilderness experience for me. Um, some of you guys know this. I've said it a lot. I think I've even said it from the stage that there's a certain time of the year that's really, really busy for me. It's, it's literally the same time that my work outside of ministry gets really busy. And then the fall season, just from August getting to November in, in church life, it's just a really uh, busy time. But then also, um, and some of you guys know this as well, is I coach my girls' middle school basketball team. And so um, I knew it was going to be a lot. I actually, I went into that season, like I, I came in, I went into that season out of a fast. Like in the summer, the Lord told me, you need to fast to get ready for it. And, and it still kicked my behind. Okay. And so last couple months I've been in this. And um, so when I said yes to, um, to come on staff here at The Rock um, almost two years ago, I was having a conversation with Josh about it. And one of the things that I felt like the Lord was telling me um, as I was saying yes to it was, Sean, you need to model fruitful and thriving bivocational life. That was what was part of saying yes. Is that saying yes to this is, Sean, you are going to need to model fruitful and thriving bivocational life for people. Um, what I didn't know is the why behind it. I didn't know that that's essentially what this whole church is. Anyone who's on staff here cannot support their family by the income they make here. There's not a single person on staff that can say that. And so I didn't realize that eventually it would be because I'd be leading a, you know, a group of people who are in that context. Um, and so I went into this season kind of with an alert in my spirit. And I found myself overextended. I found myself overly fatigued. Um, I found myself without the joy that I know I need to have to be able to endure. Um, it's been really hard. It's been, it's been quite the wilderness for me. And um, I, I felt this in my head. And, and here's what I've learned, that the devil can't destroy you He'll do everything he can to get you into compromise and overextension. If he can't take you out, he's going to get behind you and try to push you too fast. Um, and that's what, I, that's what I went through. Not only that, but one of the things that I try to do for myself, and I'll get off the Sean talk in a second, so just follow me. But one of the things I, I, I try to do to my, for myself just for my own mental health is I try to work out like consistently. Like It's really important to me. But like... You guys know this, I turned 40 this year. I keep getting injured. Like, I can't, I can't like, and I don't, I don't do CrossFit. Like, anyone who does CrossFit, you get what you get, okay? But I don't even do CrossFit, and I just keep getting hurt. Um, I was working out, and I was doing some rows, and I just strained my neck, and I haven't been able to work out. And so I just feel like this, I just feel like this attack on so many fronts. And so I'm literally like battling through this, this wilderness. And, and I, I say this to say this to you guys. I'm committed to trusting and obeying God. I'm committed to forsaking all idolatry in my life. I'm committing to abide. Um, and God is teaching me how to do that. Whether the times are good, the times are bad, times are, are easy, times are hard. It's what I have to do. That's what we have to do. I was also thinking about this as we look at this uh, Israeli uh, war with Hamas. I mean, think about what it means to be an Israeli. Think about what it means to be a person who have people who live in close proximity to you, whose mandate in life is... I don't think you have the right to exist. And so their whole lives, they are people of war. They know that, hey, we have to defend ourselves. We have to be ready to defend ourselves. I mean, think about what it would be to, 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 to be in that kind of life, to live that type of life. Now, we as Christians, as people who live in the West, we really don't understand this. We really don't. Oh, and it shows. And it shows. And so this is what, like, literally the last couple of weeks I've been wrestling with, where it's like, oh, wait, you have people, and, and, you know, obviously there's a lot of talk about 
what's next and if they're going to do a ground strike and all that stuff. And I'm just thinking to myself, if they do a ground strike, there are so many traps that are going to be set for them. There are people who are going to go into Gaza and they know they're not coming out and they're going in anyway. I have to do this though. For them, it's, it's no choice. We have to do this. What would it be like to be a person of war? And I can't speak to all of the Western world, I can't speak to all of America, but I can speak to this faith community when I say this, that we have to learn how to be people of war, right? And what I mean by that is, listen, like I know life gets hard sometimes. Like I know, and, and I'm, I've been preaching this to myself. It's like, man, okay, you're tired. Like, you know, you have a pain in your neck. I get it, I get it. But you better fight. We have to be people of war, guys. We have to be people who understand that we have an enemy that wants to take us out, that literally believes that we do not have a right to exist and wants to take us down, who is always standing in accusation against us. And the more we get settled into this comfort, and this is, you know, this is the thing I always have to, to guard for myself, is when, when hard times hit me, I, I tend to want to lean into my comforts. But we have to be a people that are training for war. When things get hard, we run towards it. We got to do that. Amen. Got to do that. So here's what I want to do. I want to uh, just look at this narrative in scripture with you. I want to look at the life of Abraham. Um, Cause I believe that as we look at um, how he did with obeying and trusting God and how he did with, uh, forsaking idols. I think if we can look at his life, then we can see parallels in our own. All right. Are you willing to, to look at this with me? All right. Let's do this. So three major world religions look at Abraham as the model for courageous and faithful living. But when you read about Abraham's life in the book of Genesis, you see that the ultimate reason why Abraham triumphs at all, the reason why um, as Christians, we can refer to him as a father of faith. It's not because he's got more faith than us, because in a minute, we're going to see how flawed he is. All right. In Genesis chapter 12, we see the call of Abraham. God promises Abraham and Sarah that he will bring salvation into the world through their descendants. And that means that they will need to have a son. They will have to have a son. The problem with that is that they're getting way up there in age and Sarah is barren. All right, Sarah can't have any children. And by Genesis 16, after they've been in Canaan for 10 years, waiting for God's promise to come to pass, they still have no son. And Sarah comes up with a bright idea. All right, let's look at it. Genesis 16 says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. He said, oh, that's a, that's a good idea. <laughs> so after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. This is Abraham speaking. Your slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think is best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she said. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. So the first thing I want us to look at together is the test of Abraham's trust and obedience. All right. So in this text, uh, Sarah 
she is proposing something that was actually common, that was legal, and that was commonplace uh, and culturally acceptable in this culture. All uh, in that part of the world at that time, this was a universal practice. Sarah, the matriarch of that clan, could bring one of her slaves to Abraham and make her a kind of second-tier wife. And any children that Hagar bears would actually belong to Sarah. All right. Now, there's a lot I can say about this. All right. But most importantly, what we need to know is that there is no place in the Bible that condones uh, this at all. Where, where when you see uh, folks like Abraham and Moses and David and Solomon and, and other people in the Old Testament uh, who are living in the experience of polygamy, it's always a disaster. It's always a disaster. Right? It's a disaster here. Right? Polygamy was never condoned by the God of the Bible anywhere in the Bible because uh, there's a lot of reasons, but mostly it's devastating to women. It's very devastating. Not only is Sarah vulnerable and defenseless, but by going forward with this, there is tremendous division and jealousy and strife and drama that hits this family. The culture assigned, think about this, it assigned a particular task and role to women. Two things specifically, bear children, build a family. And if you couldn't do that, in that culture, you were nothing. Those were the most important values for women, right? Now, it's important that we be really careful not to assume that because something is in the Bible, God is doing it or condoning it. Have you ever done that? You see something in the Bible, you're like, God, why are you letting this happen? Don't be careful to assume that just because it's there, God's condoning it. Matter of fact, you'll see God offending and undermining culture all throughout scripture. Um, And so Sarah must feel like she's letting Abraham down. She must feel like she's letting her clan down. She uh, must, now that God has told her that she is going to uh, have a son and that the world is going to be saved through the son, she probably also thinks she's letting God down and the whole world down. I mean, think about the pressure that's on her. Not only that, but Hagar's life is thrown into crisis over this. Even Ishmael's life is negatively impacted as Abraham abandons him. I mean, listen to what God says about, about Ishmael. God says he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him. It's Abraham's son. And it's easy to see why. Because once Sarah bears a son, Isaac, Ishmael grows up and every day he hears how special Isaac is. Every day as he's walking around the house, he's hearing, you're second, you're inferior. You're not as special as Isaac, is what Ishmael is hearing. And so you can see, right, how this could cause problems. Can't you see that? It would cause problems. And so if polygamy was such a devastating experience for families, you may wonder, well, why did they do it? It's very, very simple. Men wanted it and they had all the power. Think about this. Abraham at this point in Genesis 16 is the only one who has heard the voice of God. He's the only one who heard the directive to take his family and go at this point. And it's Abraham who agrees to this. Now I've always read this passage of scripture and it's always confused me how Sarah could come to him and say, hey, sleep with my maidservant. And then he does it and she comes back to him and says, this is your fault. Okay. (laughs) Like husbands, we deal with similar dynamics in don't don't amen me. Don't amen me. As it was coming out of my mouth, I was like, if I get any support for this, I repent. I love you guys. There's always always confused me how she could go to him and say, We should do this. And he says, Okay. And then later she says, This is on you, homeboy. I'm not getting baited into this any longer. (laughs) Yeah, so Abraham agreed to this, right? Uh, The narrator actually makes it really clear when he says Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. Um, The translation I read said Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah, which is to say that at first he was listening to the voice of God. Now he's listening to the voice of Sarah. This is totally on Abraham. 
So let's think about Abraham for a second. Abraham wanted a family. He wanted a family. Abraham had in front of him two women. He had Hagar and he had Sarah, right? With Hagar, he probably thought to himself, I'm an old man, but I'm fertile. And she's young and fertile. With Sarah, he knew she's old and barren. And so if I try to have a family through Sarah, I will have to rely on divine supernatural grace. If I try to have a family through Hagar, that's something I can do within my own human ability. And so the choices before Abraham is whether he wants to save himself through works or if he wants to save himself through grace or if he wants to be saved, excuse me, through grace. Through Hagar, Abraham could secure the blessing of God through what he could achieve in his own power. Through Sarah, Abraham could secure the blessing of God through what he could only receive by God's power. The decision is whether he wants to save himself through his own human ability or whether he wants to rely on God and his supernatural grace. And so this is why later on, as we look in the book of Galatians, uh, Paul talks about obtaining salvation by works and he references Abraham. And so what Paul is telling us in the book of Galatians is that you can try to save yourself by righteousness you produce and bring to God, which doesn't work, or you can be saved by righteousness that God produces and brings to you. Hagar and Sarah are signs to us as New Testament believers. They symbolize salvation by works or salvation by grace. Now, these are signs to us, but these are real women to Abraham, okay? These are real women to him. And so he could decide to save himself on the basis of what he could humanly attain with his own capabilities, Hagar, or he could rely on the blessing of a supernatural miracle in the grace of God, Sarah. And this great godly patriarch, the father of faith. You know what he did? He bet on himself. He bet on himself. He went with Hagar. And the immediate result is pain and disaster. Lives around him begin to blow up. We see it here, but, but I, believe, I believe we know something about that. Right, church? What has happened for you when you have chosen your way over God's way? See, the ultimate consequence of this decision is that they do conceive. And out of his thirst for a son, which was the thing that was most important to him, out of his lack of faith, Abraham rationalizes compromise. He tries to help God out and he births Ishmael. And Ishmael became this daily reminder for Abraham and Sarah of failure. That every day that they saw Ishmael, they, didn't, they, they weren't grateful. It wasn't love. It wasn't warmth. Do you know what they thought of every time they saw Ishmael? It was regret. It was regret. So the question is, have you ever given birth to an Ishmael? Think about that. Have you ever given birth to an Ishmael? You got in front of God, you bet on yourself, and you made a decision that launched you into a season of suffering. Maybe you're still in it right now. Maybe you're still dealing with it right now. I mean, think about this. The Israeli-Arab conflict begins right here. Right here. The reason why we will never see sustained peace in the world stems from the lowest moment of a man from whom so much of the world gets their spiritual roots. So not only does Abraham blow up the lives of these women by birthing Ishmael, Abraham abandons Ishmael twice. In the passage I read earlier, Sarah gives Abraham a hard time about agreeing to have a child with Hagar, and Abraham gives a very callous response. Okay, I don't know if you heard it the first time when I read it. He said this to her. When she gave him a hard time about Uh, Hagar and Ishmael, Abraham said this in verse six. He said, your slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think is best. Or in other words, Hagar is your slave. Do whatever you want. That's his response. And so Sarah begins to mistreat her, but it's actually more than that because the same word for mistreat that you see in, in Hebrew is the same word that they use for the Egyptians and what they were doing to the Israelites when they weren't making bricks fast enough. Okay. And so it must have been 
terrible abuse. <clears throat> she certainly must have been abusing her. And it had to be bad enough because it caused a pregnant woman to leave and go seek out life in the wilderness. So it must have been bad enough. But it was Abraham who authorized it. And only because of an encounter with God does Hagar think better of it and return home. All right. But five chapters later, chapter 21, Abraham and Sarah conceive and they finally give birth to a son. And Sarah completely turns against Hagar and Ishmael wants them cast out again. And after God assures Abraham that uh, Ishmael will survive, Abraham concedes and again sends Ishmael into the wilderness. Now, can you imagine the damage that's being done to this kid? Genesis 21, 15 says, when the water and the skin was gone, okay, it's the second time they've been cast out there in the wilderness again, they're gone. When the water and the skin was gone, she put, this is Hagar, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand for I will make him into a great nation. I have a lot of compassion for Ishmael. Um, have you ever, as you've read the Bible, found a character in the Bible whose life is your life story? Have you ever done that? Ishmael's life story is similar to mine. He was sent out into the wilderness by his father. And one of the verses that, that reference Ishmael is literally my life verse. Can I share it with you? It's my life verse. My life verse, you know, some people's life verse is pretty and flowery and it's amazing. Okay. All right. Here's my life verse. And I'm serious. This is my life verse. Genesis 21, 20. And God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. If you've ever been abandoned, you can, like, I don't know if you know how that feels. And so there's, there's compassion here. So, you know, again, in this series, we're talking about abiding in the wilderness. We're all going to live through wilderness experiences. And for me, every single time, I get into the wilderness. It's a crisis of faith for me because abandonment has hurt me so much that even when I get a small taste of it, if I can't hear God's voice, if I can't sense his nearness, it becomes personal for me, very personal for me. And so I don't know what triggers hit you when you're in the wilderness, but whatever it is, you got to look for God in it. You got to look for God in it. Amen. Because God found this boy. And so we see how he does, how Abraham does with test, the test of trust and obedience. Let's look quickly at how he does with the test of idolatry. All right. So um, Abraham makes a mess of his family by choosing himself over, over grace. He births Ishmael. He abandons Ishmael. And though he still ends up with the son that God has promised him in Isaac, um, he even begins to make a mess of that as well. Because one chapter after we see him sending Ishmael off to the wilderness by himself, in Genesis 22, God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. <clears throat> Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So now Abraham has two sons. One son he abandons and the other one becomes his ultimate and absolute hope. One son he doesn't love at all, the other son he loves too much. Ishmael represented compromise and a lack of faith, but Isaac represented the idolatry of loving anything more than God. Both of them were destructive and both of them require God's intervention. All right, and so to Abraham's credit, he follows the command. 
he loads up the wood, he takes the fire and the knife and he takes Isaac up on the mountain, he straps him down and he gets ready to slay him. And God says, as we all know, as we read this passage, God says to him, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. So what's the lesson here? What's the lesson? The lesson is that when you're in the wilderness, not only should you be looking for God, but when you're in the wilderness, also look for your idols. Look for your idols. Because part of the suffering you are experiencing when you're in the wilderness is unavoidable. Okay, hear me on this. Part of the suffering that you experience when you're in the wilderness is unavoidable. All right, you lose a loved one. Um, Your livelihood is in some way impacted. You have a company reorg, you lose your job. You have a financial reversal. Um, Someone walks away from you relationally, right? Some of what you're dealing with is unavoidable. It had very little to do with you. It, It should hurt because it happened to you, right? It happened to you. And these are important things. But when you suffer loss in these important areas of life and it's too important to you, they're your main source of fulfillment in life. It's, it's your rock, so to speak. When they're too important to you, then the suffering that you're dealing with is magnified through idolatry. And there's always idolatrousness clinging to our relationships and our desires that become easier to see when we're in the wilderness, right? Are you guys getting what I'm saying here? That whenever you're suffering, whenever you're experiencing hard times, don't give yourself too much credit for the fact that you're suffering, but also don't sit back and think none of it is on you. It's important to do that. It's important to think that. So Psalm 81 doesn't just call us to trust and obey, right? Uh, But also, to Aaron's point a few weeks ago, it calls us to repentance. It calls us to self-examination for inordinate idolatrous desires that magnifies and they're exacerbated in these seasons, right? They contribute to some of our suffering in hard times. I don't know how it is for you guys, but sometimes when I suffer, I spend a lot of time just reeling over the fact that I'm suffering in the first place. And I'm not even addressing the issue. Am I alone on that? I didn't hear enough. Don't, don't we do this? We have a hard time and we spend more time complaining about the hard time than just launching into what we have to do, right? And so you gotta look for, you gotta look for the, the idolatrousness in that season. Sometimes you lose a relationship and it, it comes out that maybe that relationship was way too important to you. You lose an opportunity and that opportunity was way too important to you. And so when you suffer, again, I'm not, trust me, I'm not saying it's all on you. So I'm saying just take a step back and say, what am I relying on too much? Because this hurts, but it hurts more maybe than it should because my heart is committed more to these things that I really don't need, right? Right, that song, Honey in the Rock, I have all that I need, right? You are all that I need. But it takes us losing things for us to realize that, right? That's easy to sing into, until you're suffering. I mean, think about this. Think about the, the three Hebrew boys that got thrown in the fire. We all love that story. We think it's amazing, Right? And we want to have these amazing experiences. There's so many amazing stories in the Bible. You got David stepping to a, a giant. You got Daniel doing an a overnight sleepover with lions. And you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. You actually have to be in danger. Did you know that? This actually happened to them. Homeboy was in a den with hungry lions. And the moment someone cuts you off in traffic, you're ready to act like you've never met Jesus a day in your life. 
Grow up. Sean. <laughs> talking to myself. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to myself. <clears throat> so how did, how did Abraham do on this test? Okay, so if, if the conditions of getting honey in the rock is that you have to trust and obey, you have to forsake your idols. How did he do on this test? I would say he struggled. All right, I would say he struggled. He struggled to trust and obey. And although he was ready to carry out God's orders to slay Isaac, um, it's very clear that he idolized his son Isaac as well. But here's the beauty of it. All right, the beauty is God already knew he wouldn't pass the test. How do I know that? Because in Genesis 15, something remarkable happens. All right. In Genesis 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham. And when he makes this covenant with Abraham, he does something very interesting. All right. uh, God had Abraham prepare the ceremony. So in ancient times, when you would, um, when you would do a covenant, what you would do is you would take animals. All right, this is graphic. You take animals and you would literally cut them in half. All right, so you cut all the animals in half and then you would split them apart and you would create an aisle for you to walk through. All right, and that, that specified something really important. It was really symbolic. Um, and, and, and so ba basically what it means, it was an agreement that as both parties passed through the pieces, they were saying, if I break this covenant, so shall I be broken and destroyed like these animals. That's what they were saying. And so God makes this covenant with Abraham and Abraham, he sets up the whole ceremony, he does all the stuff and then something crazy happens. God walks through the aisle, but he doesn't let Abraham walk through. This is astonishing. I, I'm sure when this happened, Abraham was like, what in the world? God walks through it, but he doesn't let Abraham do it. And do you know what that means? God was saying to Abraham in that moment, if I don't fulfill my promises and conditions of this covenant, may I be destroyed? But not only that, I will take on the consequences if you don't fulfill the terms of the covenant. God's grace is extended to Abraham even before the test starts. And so here's the ultimate extension of grace. And here's the honey in the rock for Abraham. That even with all of Abraham's mistakes, God rescues and preserves the lives of both Ishmael and Isaac. God keeps his promise to bless the world through Abraham's descendants. Amen. Let's stand together. I'm going to have our worship team come forward. We're going to respond in worship in a moment. God rescues and preserves the life of both Ishmael and Isaac. He keeps his promise to bless the world, even in the midst of Abraham's failure. The question then is, that's, that's your alarm to leave the service? All right. That's, that's how you cut me off? Okay. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. All right. But how does God do that? All right. We can actually see it in God's treatment of his sons because like Isaac in Genesis 22, who was strapped on the wood on Mount Moriah, but was delivered many years later on the very same mountains, another firstborn son would be stretched out on the wood to die. But there on Mount Calvary, when the beloved son of God cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There was no voice from heaven announcing deliverance. Instead, God the Father paid the price in silence. Why? Because the true substitute for Abraham's son was God's only son, Jesus, who died to bear our punishment. And in Genesis 21, Ishmael is rejected. He's thrown out of his father's house. He's in the desert. He's going to die. He's crying. And the angel of the Lord comes to Hagar and says, God has heard the cry of the boy. Why does he do that? Why did he do that? Because centuries later, another poor woman was visited by an angel 
And the angel said, you shall bear a son and his name shall be called not Ishmael, but Emmanuel. And when the son was born into this world, he experienced nothing but rejection. The Bible says that Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. And even his father abandoned him. But here's the difference between Ishmael and Jesus. That when Jesus was at the very end of his life, when he was stretched out, when Jesus was dying on the cross for you and me, he cried out too, didn't he? Again, my God, my God. He cried out. But God didn't answer him. He let him perish. Why? Why does God bless Abraham? Why does God bless us? Why did God hear, hear Ishmael's cry? Why does he hear our cry? God can do that because he didn't hear Jesus' cry. Jesus came and took what we deserved. God did not hear the cry of his boy so that through Jesus Christ, he could hear all of our cries. And that actually makes him ju both just and justifier of all those who believe. Amen. Amen. And so if you're here today and it's been a little tough, right? You've been, you've, you've been living through a hard season. I want to encourage you. Listen, life is a wilderness. This is, this is it. This is the ball game. Life is a wilderness. You and I will experience, and I hate to break this to you, you and I will experience in this lifetime, we'll experience more famines than feasts. It just happens that way. You read scripture, you see that. Children of Israel, more famines than feasts. Life is a wilderness. There's a rock in the wilderness. And if you commit to not panicking in it and not running from it, but looking for God, you will find him. And not only will you find him, if you endure wilderness well, and what do I mean by that? If you trust and obey, if you abide, and if you look for and forsake your idols, as we see in Psalm 81, you will find honey in the rock. That all over the room, I bet you if I put a mic in some of your faces, you could say some of the hardest times of my life have produced some of the greatest treasures for me. Right? So everyone in this room can say that. Yet, we go through a hard time, and what do we do? We default to panic and running. And I'm just here to tell you, and again, I never want to get to a place where because someone's on this stage, like they don't have the ability to be in transformation like you guys. It's, it's the joy of my life to be a leader in this community, but I'm growing like you're growing. And you're going to go through wilderness experiences, and I am as well. And we need community. We need people around us. They're going to look us in our face and say, stay. Stay. Amen. All heads bowed. All eyes closed. You're here today. And you would say, Sean, I need this. It's been really, really hard for me. I just want you to slip your hand up. I just want to pray for you. I get it. I see you. I see you. I see you. All around the room. You would even say, Sean, I'm a believer. I know what it means to walk with God, but I just have not in this season been able to hear his voice clearly. And the devil hasn't yet destroyed me, but man, is he getting me to question whether I want to go into compromise or overextension. Just raise your hand. I want to pray for you as well. Lord Jesus, we thank you. 
Lord, just for all the, the different seasons that we live through in life. It's one of the beauties of walking with you, God, that you're not just a God in the good times. You're not just our God in prosperity. But God, even when we are in the lowest of lows, God, you've promised to be there. Lord, even when we fail the test, even when we struggle, God, we thank you that you've committed to us even when we blow it. Why? Because you sent your son. You sent your son. And so thank you, God, for the power that you give us as believers um, to contend, the power that you give us to stand and having done all to stand. Lord, we continue to do so. And so we just sense, and my brother came to me, and I, my spirit testifies with this, that there are those of us in the room who in your hard times, uh, when the pressure is on you, this is, this is when you're the most tempted to maybe make irrational decisions. And oftentimes what that could be is because we don't have the fear of God in our eyes, right? And so I just think also there's an opportunity uh, for, for God to really put not just his, his spirit on you, his presence on you for, for all the things that that means as far as comfort, but even the fear of God on you to give you a sense of his power. This is what we need, church, right? That I, that I love, that I serve a God who in kindness leads me to repentance but also love that like, I, I, I serve a God of war as well, okay? I was talking to someone about this uh, earlier this week. Um, there's something really beautiful about being married to Amy Patterson. You know what it is? She don't play. And so there's often times when I'm like struggling with something. And yes, I have the fear of God, but you know what I also have? I have a fear of Amy, right? And some of us just need that in the spirit, right? We just need to be people that are like, hey man, I have an opportunity to compromise right now. But Lord, I don't wanna break your heart. I know you're a holy God. And so Jesus, we just ask that you would fill us with your presence, God. With everything that that means, Lord, we need the fullness of that. That in scripture, you talk about the idea of blessing your people. And that word blessing in scripture means multidimensional flourishing. And so I pray that you would grant your people that right now in Jesus' name. That you would grant us the ability to flourish in multidimensional ways. Lord, that salvation is coming into our lives in multidimensional ways. That maybe we're good in this area, we're good in this area, but man, we're struggling here, we're struggling here. And I thank you, Jesus, that you don't just care about our souls. You care, Lord, that we prosper just as our soul prospers. And so for those of us that are hurting, for those of us that are struggling, God, I pray that we would just get a, a greater sense walking out of here of your goodness, of your nearness, of the fear of God and everything that you give us so that we can triumphantly war against the things that come against us. Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.